all of us have got blind spots and often they're big ones we don't notice what we don't notice and also we tend to focus on the recent past and the very near future uh, most people haven't trained themselves to think even uh, five years out let alone 20 years out and right now in this world we need future thinking welcome to the secrets of success podcast i'm your host dr ken keys well one of the number one trends globally in professional development these days is this idea of coaching of having an executive coach corporations having team coaches or having team coaching done so today's show is with dr marilyn atkinson who actually founded uh, erickson's coaching school and she'll get into that is a detail this is actually the coaching school now it's its 40th year so she has a lot of staying power in the industry but that being said here's my encouragement for you this is who are you meeting with to connect with around a coach now uh, Marilyn does talk about the difference between a mentor and a coach a mentor shares some advice and etc but um, most coaching models or many coaching models not most but many were are really around a series of how do I ask quality questions to help you come to the answers that you seek that it's really not my opinion or my advice but it's really yours and I've facilitated that for you so enjoy the show and my encouragement is is that you know everybody listening that is some kind of leadership role or one development role is that to consider getting a coach and all of us that have had a coach I've had a coach slash mentor at different times throughout my lifetime is that it's needed right now life's complex a lot of things going on and so think about that I mean CRG has uh, resources of certain individuals that can help you and Marilyn does as well our featured product uh, is since CRG sponsors this podcast is to become deeper and more aware of your values we have a brand new e-course what do you really value so my encouragement is that you would go on to the CRG site we'll put it in the, the show notes here find out more about it and take yourself on a journey of clarity of self-discovery and our assessments and tools in many ways are a virtual coach to help you get clear about who you are uh, how you can know yourself and be able to go to the next level and that's why we call it what do you really value and what motivates self and others so thank you as always for listening to the secrets of success now here's our guest dr marilyn atkinson welcome to the secrets of success podcast i'm your host dr ken keys well it's always an honor to have a peer well I don't even want to say a peer somebody we've looked up to for many years who we've known who is an expert in really helping others increase their performance and fulfillment in life in fact she teaches other coaches around the world to do it so welcome to the show dr. Marilyn Atkinson Marilyn welcome to the show thank you Ken and as a peer and a colleague uh, congratulations on all the success you have all these offices around the world and certified coaching and we'll get into that journey but uh, congratulations on all your accolades and the things that you've done for the industry to serve others I appreciate it. thank you now Marilyn you've been in this industry for a while a few years now and um, before we get into your coaching uh, just a little bit about your background and where this all sort of started where, where was the um, embryonic stage of Marilyn getting into coaching and we can even go bef before that so just share with the audience a little bit of your story and journey to get here okay Ken uh, well let's go back into the 70s and early 80s I was an industrial psychologist uh, mainly working out of Toronto I'd fly back to Vancouver as well and uh, I was working with a variety of large corporations at that time IBM being the biggest one I spent about two years being one of their consultants and 
Royal Bank and so on and so forth. And I was very, very interested in how uh, companies move past their oh, conflicts on job between huge departments, for one thing, conflicts between individuals, various ways in which uh, groups would spiral, let's call it that, into some kind of ineffectiveness and how team coaching would bring them out again. Now, we didn't call it team coaching back then, Ken, but I was interested in what was the elixir, the you know magic sauce that made all the difference so that people got their vision back, got their purpose back, got their interest back in having the larger corporation work well. So this what, was going what did, on. What did you discover? What was what's the elixir, if I may pre, <laughs> pre, preempt your response? Well, this is where it got interesting because when I looked at uh, what made the most difference to people, uh, it was first of all safety that they knew what they were doing effectively, that their opinions seemed to count, that they were able to. Um, take some autonomy in their jobs, that they were able to express their talents, all the normal things that we know make the biggest difference, but also that they could express what was going on to them, excuse me, on with them effectively to someone who really would listen. Now, this Mm -hmm. is the beginning points of coaching, understanding how to listen to someone who's having problems But more than that, to ask the kind of questions that allowed them to get their vision back, uh, felt um, in the group again, whatever it was that was needed. And just the the talent and the skill to be able to craft responses and questions that would elicit that. So if if I may, if, if I digress for a moment, Marilyn, is what got you motivated to go down this path in the first place? How did this become Marilyn's purpose? Okay. Well, I began years ago with a real interest in human development. And go back to college. I thought in my early years I'd like to work with the United Nations. So I was both uh, interested in sociology and psychology. So n- not a surprise that I became an expert in team coaching later on in life and very much an expert in or a proponent of uh, large uh, world game-changing conversations between different kinds of teams around the world. Uh, I've been very interested in how we as human beings can really make our lives and our uh, world a better place. Mm. Well, thank you for all that effort and work. And obviously, we both still have a job to help the two or three people who are left or are not quite there yet. That, <laughs> that was just a slight bit of humor there. Oh, is, just a little bit there. <laughs> just, just a little. Uh, that's why you have multiple coaching schools. We're all needed. With that, you were an industrial psychologist. And, and this is not to be sexist at all, but there were not too many women industrial psychologists in the 70s. That, what kind of courage did it take you to get into this space at that time I mean, there's, it's now more open, but mm. what, were, what were some of the sort of the personal, um, I'll call it, character traits that, that even allowed you to get in the space in the first place? Well, that's a good question because, you know what, after I left college, which was indeed very sexist, but after I actually got into the field, I just happily uh, moved along Uh, sending in uh, presentations, speaking to different leaders, and being accepted. I didn't have um, need for courage very much. I had my own overwhelming curiosity and uh, uh, sense of uh, I know how to fix things, which I certainly did in the early days. I had uh, an overview of different kinds of creative solutions for many different organizational difficulties even back then and people accepted me it's interesting and Marilyn what you're saying to the audience is that competence 
breeds confidence in individuals and it just sort of negates any of this other stuff that might be floating around in the conversation. Yeah, I, I haven't met it a lot. Do you know that? I hear all these stories of burdened women who haven't been able to go past the glass ceilings presented. I seem to have walked into coaching all sorts of vice presidents of various companies and having no difficulty at all uh, being heard, seen, requested, uh, sought after. So that's the way it's been for me, except, of course, getting bank loans. <laughs> way back well, in the old days, women didn't get bank loans, so uh, starting my business was difficult. Well, there, that is the, uh, the sexist thing continues on that side. Well, with that, it's interesting, and I, I didn't actually anticipate going here, Marilyn, but do you have any insights about why you had sort of this path that seemed to be less resistant and others not is do you have any insight that you could share with the listeners that might reflect how your condition was different than what other people are articulating good question um, a, a bunch of things uh, one was um, my own research I was always doing research Kim and a lot of my real interest was human creativity and how people got inspired so I'd work with myself a lot uh, my own inspiration and do the same with others and that really did eventually become the beginning points of uh, understanding how coaching worked second mm -hmm. thing uh, I was involved with brain research even in the early days I was very very interested in um, what later became known as neuroplasticity, how people could change themselves, even in short order, that it wasn't a uh, huge, complex uh, process of uh, climbing mountains over our, our history, that, in fact, it was much easier than we thought. It takes about three weeks to change a habit. I learned that early. And that once you built new habits, you could maintain them. So I've been always interested in assisting people to do the same and leave behind what we call the problem-focused uh, approach to life, the idea that, you know, life is a huge hurdle that requires lots of psychiatric help and uh, that people have far more problems than they think. The whole problem-focused approach uh, left me cold and I found that inspiring people was something that I enjoyed and was easy and that I could help them maintain mm. well Marilyn you have a agreement with your colleague here that I mean there's all kinds of research coming out now that when you start focusing on the negative you get more of it right exactly I mean, that yep. I mean not that I'm proposing the law of attraction directly but just if I keep focusing on the CRAP, then I can get more of that. And if I focus towards the future, that's what you're talking about. What do I want versus what I don't want? And that you very quickly right. discovered that if I take responsibility to move towards what I want, what I don't want is holding me back is not going to hold me back. Is that correct? Hey, you're speaking here. What <laughs> I discovered again and again. And I found all sorts of ways to assist different kinds of people stuck in different kinds of ways or with different beliefs uh, to move past their old parameters. These eventually became part of the coaching program. Well, actually, I think this is a good segue, if we may, Marilyn, is, and not everybody listening knows yet that you have a coaching school and you're president of Erickson Coaching International. So at the time of this taping, because it could change after people listen to this a year from now, how many schools are you operating now? I can hardly believe it. We're in 64 countries and probably over 95 schools. I have to recount them after this last month. Yeah, but I, I, I sense triple digits in your future. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, we have... Uh, uh, had about 10 nations join us in the last three months, which has been phenomenal. Uh, we've hardly been able to keep up. 
because these are all avid Ericsson fans and colleagues who've made it possible for others to um, become students of this work. And I've been really very delighted to see the growth happen so quickly. Mm. Well, congratulations. You have to love the book Tipping Point and when the critical mass is, is met. And, of course, Marilyn, it was overnight success, you know, like 30 years later. <laughs> well, the book Tipping Point became a core part of our world game, which is about creating a tipping point for human development. And it's about how with only 3% of really – strong leadership, uh, we can create a tipping point in any company towards, uh, first of all, effective... Okay, so sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting you for a reason, Marilyn. Sure. You just said to the listeners that 3% of a, a firm, positive leadership in the models you're teaching is enough mm -hmm. to tip the company. Are you, yeah. are you kidding me? Is that real or... Oh, well, think about tipping points. See, uh, the original idea uh, postulated 10%, and that made great sense when we're talking about um, the development of the Internet or the development of iPhones, uh, any kind of technology. You have to see it around a little bit, and as soon as you see about 10% of your company using any particular technology or adopting any particular uh, way of organizing, uh, people will climb aboard. But that's not so with leadership. Mm. Think of the great leaders of the world uh, and how, in fact, uh, the Gandhis connected so many people, so many dots. The Martin Luther Kings brought people in because a strong leader uh, speaks at the level of values and vision which is much more comprehensive and tipping, if you like, than any of the lower areas of the mind system. Lower meaning um, focusing on our capabilities or our actions and the ways we can use technologies or whatever to make them happen. Leadership focuses on who we are and who we want to become. And a strong leader can move a large group over the tipping point and keep in a them very short order. I think yeah. Marilyn, for the listeners, that's encouraging. So if I'm part of a volunteer group or leading a company or have my own small business, it, I don't need everybody to be on board. I just need a small percentage to believe in what we're talking about here to be able to get to where I need to go. Right. And that's what's so encouraging about the work I'm doing because uh, we've watched small groups have a big impact uh, and say, you know, I'm part of the tipping point. I'm part of the 3%. And the 3% has been one of our code words, actually. Well, interesting. I'm going to hijack that from for you. So I'm, I'm putting down 3%. I'm going to put it on my board by the time we finish this call in this interview. So thank <laughs> well, you, Marilyn. I can <laughs> show you a picture of 300 people with black T-shirts on it with one big sign. We're part of the 3%. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And it's also uh, very encouraging that, you know, again, with the small numbers, I can make a big difference versus just feeling overwhelmed or burdened that I need 90% to kind of join before – that, you know, there's a real difference in that framework. But I want to digress again for a second, Marilyn. You were doing a lot of coaching and work with individuals and overcoming certain mindsets. Is there a theme of a few things that you found was in many of your clients you worked with over the years as a coach that would encourage the people that are listening here as far as conditions that people have that seems to be quite, not necessarily generic, but general, and uh, how you address that or, or, or how you can do just little, sort of a mini encouragement coaching with the listeners today? Um, big question, actually, Ken. Uh, of course. Uh, I knew you could handle it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're really talking about how we pull our own plug. And generally, uh, we do it with internal dialogue. Now, you know, there's all sorts of different kinds of internal commentary that people specialize in. 
some people are perfectionists and they are constantly pointing out their own faults and flaws as they go through life and they become their own worst critic. Some people are very much uh, determined to have everyone love them and get very upset when other people don't. Some people are very much aimed for success and um, their focus then often turns to failure. It's quite interesting because the mind system that human beings have adopted, um, do you mind me getting very general about this? Sure. Uh, since we built language about 80,000 years ago, um, has tended to focus on what the problem is rather than what the solution is. Now, there's all sorts of reasons for that. That's that, First of all, it helped our survival a lot. Uh, we needed to really notice, you know, where the saber-toothed tigers were and uh, build our our comfortable uh, pathways across the belt so that we could um, be the safest as that we could possibly be. But um, the frameworks that human beings have built for themselves tend to result in stratified comfort, if you want to call it, becoming as comfortable as possible in gradually limiting our range rather than expanding it. And uh, this is, seems to be a natural part of any system that forms. It gradually gets stratified and it gets formulated so that it doesn't have much movement possible. Now, I'm a coach. I come into organizations. I work with teams. And what we're continually doing is bringing in um, ability sets to move past these various models. Uh, one is we, we've, we've got the needed knowledge. We don't need any more, thank you. But in fact, they do. Uh, one is uh, we can only work with loyal people. Uh, disloyal people are everybody on the horizon. There's all sorts of ways in which people uh, prick their own balloons, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. Some is, you know, people get addicted to power and they want to keep building it or they get addicted to um, money. That's a big one. All of us uh, need to have a good income, but the money addiction destroys many companies because people won't discover creative resources they've got that don't lead to a direct return next month. Mm. So on a, I, I'm just answering the full range of what that kind of question can uh, bring up. Well, thank you for that. Now, Marilyn, when you and I started in this industry, as you said, it wasn't called coaching back then. Uh, it really has moved forward. As a person, I know you have a bias, but I'm, I'm thankful for that, is why should people who are listening consider getting a coach? I think I partially answered it in the last question, Ken. All of us have got blind spots. And often they're big ones. We don't notice what we don't notice. And also we tend to focus on the recent past and the very near future. Uh, most people haven't trained themselves to think even uh, five years out, let alone 20 years out. And right now in this world, we need future thinking. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, uh, People often don't think team. They don't know how to work effectively with a group mind and build uh, group coherence. Uh, some do, but many, many don't. And a team coach can make all the difference to uh, corporate viability, building uh, ways in which uh, uh, teams can build creative new products, uh, build effective um, um, specialized ways to get things done. Uh, people are much more expert than they allow themselves to know. And when they work with a coach, a lot of that expertise shows up because a coach asks questions that open up the mind system to areas it doesn't normally go. Now, is that making sense to you? Here. Absolutely. This is, again, um, getting the secrets of success listeners to think about you know, this 
the viability or the possibility of getting a coach. If we actually scroll back, Meryl, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, uh, getting a coach for a senior executive was an admission of oh, incompetence or they were very sensitive towards that. Um, so when people hesitate getting a coach, in your experience, w what have been some of the reasons that people don't embrace this idea of having a coach? Because, I mean, if you think about sports, to have a high-performing athlete without a coach, you would think that was ludicrous. Yet when we get into the business world, until recently, that was always sort of tentative. What do you think were some of the reasons that contribute to that? Three come to mind immediately. Let me give them to you. Number one is that people, first of all, they don't have time. They think their life is on track, but even with its problems, they think they're expert already in solving those problems. Often it's kind of amazing, especially corporate leaders, even when they're going down the drain, um, they are still thinking they're going to solve it all themselves. So call it ego if you like, but people don't have time and they think they know what they're doing. Again, blind spots. Uh, we do have the time. Coaching doesn't take a long time. Solution-focused coaching, which is what I do, can be a very successful half-hour meeting that makes a huge difference in a leader's life. A very successful half-hour meeting. And uh, do that uh, for four months in a row and the person's changed their mindset to a whole lot of things. And that's with not any advice being given. Uh, we work with a, um, a process of coaching, solution-focused, that involves not giving advice, assisting people to find their own creative solutions, uh, discovering with them how to link those solutions together to create maps, meaningful maps, um, people discover they can think much further than they thought they could and um, have insights that surprise them. Mm. So those are two of the key reasons. The third one is that they've already visited a coach or had a so-called coaching session that wasn't solution-focused at all, that tended to be someone else's, um, if you want to, I'll, I'll use a nice word, which is mentoring, or um, um, consulting, and the, they feel they know better than the so-called coach, and they probably do. There's been a lot of uh, performance coaching out in the world that hasn't been coaching, effective coaching at all. So the name has become sullied quite a bit by the quality of coaching that's been out there in the first 15 years of the coaching movement. What you're talking about is a continuum from this concept of consulting to coaching to full coaching, which is simply having this interactive person to listen to get the questions. Would you say that all of this applies in the different situations? This is a great question. Uh, some people need more challenging. Some people need more Deep listening is what I call it, uh, because they don't listen to themselves very much. Uh, so we assist them to find their own solutions by asking the kind of question that takes them into different parts of their own creativity. Mm. Uh, some people uh, need to think futures. They really need to build a plan and, uh, first of all, look long range at what they're aiming for and then build the steps backward from that solution to the present situation. So we assist them to think system, uh, seeing themselves as part of a larger system, seeing their company as part of a larger system. Uh, some people need very much to uh, build a framework that includes their own inner critics so they can actually bring their own critics into the conversation, but not let the critics run the show. Explain that a bit more, Marilyn. Okay, well, if you think about any great plan that's implementable, first you need to have uh, what we call a dream or a, a long-term vision. What, what do we want to create in the long run? 
how might it show up as a uh, product or service or a possibility that we could make real. And once we turn that into a clear, comprehensive pictures of what it might look like, sound like, feel like, what it, what it will, how it will affect others, who might the stakeholders be, uh, what, what will everybody take home in the end, uh, then we can start to uh, build strategies to get there. And the strategies, the person has many more strategies than they think, but they need to look at the various places where they've said no to themselves. No, this one won't work or that one won't work. And actually uh, start to hear their inner critic without believing it. Now, we assist them to do that so that they can actually look at strategies, put them together, build a creative product or service, uh, connect thoughts that they didn't have before. Does that make sense? Mm. And see a, a much larger comprehensive whole where they begin to see all sorts of ways they can make something happen, even if the uh, one pathway doesn't work very well. They've got three other ones that they've uh, already tested. Oh, so we can, sure. yeah, we can in this way really build um, the kind of initiative and mo- motivation uh, that allows that person to become unstoppable. Now, when you think about coaching success, what other hindrances in your, in your experience have gotten in the way of coaching success for people? Well, I've mentioned a few, mostly starting with their own inner commentary. Um, very frequently, the next big one is inability. I think I mentioned this earlier, inability to really work effectively with teams. Uh, many leaders are entrepreneurs to start with. They may have an engineering mindset. They may have a um, I've got it uh, covered mindset. But they tend to work from their own mindset out rather than um, being comfortable bringing people in, um, exploring with a group uh, alternative ways to accomplish specific iterations, um, finding some of the best people for different kinds of teams. This takes a lot of trust sometimes. So the issue is sometimes trust. They Mm -hmm. don't know how to give people enough trust that um, people will feel free to give them their best. Well, if you think about some of the work that uh, Marshall Goldsmith did, that was linking back to the old leadership model where I have to be the expert in the room versus you are the facilitator of the experts you have hired. Yes, exactly. And we're working as coaches. I'm working often uh, with large teams. uh, And this is one of the biggest areas. We are making a, a difference now corporately, assisting companies to give uh, permission to agile teams, to uh, strong um, leadership groups to produce those results without being um, stopped by administrative, um, well, call it turmoil. Mm, Absolutely, absolutely. If I was listening to the show and I was looking for a coach, what are the qualities and characteristics should I look in or look for, pardon me, in a potential coach if I was going to hire somebody? Okay, good question. First of all, get an ICF certified coach. That means International Coach Federation certified coach because these are people who've done a good deal of personal work and um, practice and have uh, passed a certification process. Secondly, find someone who's worked corporately and worked with team coaching for some time if possible. Uh, We're training team coaches around the world and Ericsson is uh, consistently um, creating the kind of milieu where team coaches uh, stretch, change, develop, work with different kinds of people, work with cross 
national teams, online teams, teams that have uh, uh, fast results required, teams that are, are working with uh, creative uh, products that require a lot of, uh, call them uh, prima donnas to work together. Mm. I've never heard of that word. You don't know prima donnas. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Marilyn, totally. But exactly one of the hindrances to coaching. Exactly. So we need to train coaches to work with these kind of mindsets. And once they're trained and can relax with any kind of team, away you go. You've got somebody who uh, can really make a difference to your company. We're training a lot of in-house coaches, by the way, uh, coach trainers and coach uh, team coaches, because now the larger corporations that we're working with um, prefer working with their own people and often for good reason. Those are people who can understand some of the major difficulties the company's facing. But uh, in any case, uh, the amount of training and uh, skill building makes a big difference. Mm, for sure. Now, if I'm thinking about a coach personally, one-on-one, -on -one, any, any differences in my selection process? or uh, Most people uh, like to test out a few. It's very useful to find a coach who's got some of your uh, same uh, life parameters, so to speak. For example, perhaps uh, uh, you might be more comfortable with a male coach. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. You might be more comfortable with someone who has some of your background, knows some of your uh, own corporate issue areas. But these aren't absolutely necessary at all. Often it's the person's flexibility. If you tend to be an open kind of guy, and, and I think you are, you'd like a coach that shows their openness easily, who laughs easily, who's there willing to have fun with you. Mm. So really, I mean, it's like sort of like dating. You're looking for chemistry, and that chemistry needs to resonate for that individual. Obviously, even if this, the coach is gifted, but if you don't get along with them or don't like each other, that's not going to go at the way that you would want. It, it actually uh, doesn't usually take too long before a gifted coach and uh, even a very different kind of client get, can start to get their dance steps together. But um, you would want to start out looking for somebody you like. Mm. Absolutely. And for sure. And, uh, and I think that's just an encouragement is sometimes organizations, I mean, not everything's flexible where you are sort of quote unquote given a coach is that uh, my encouragement is, is that you can speak up and say, you know what, I want to be coached, but I, I just think that this relationship's not best. And so that it's, it's completely okay to be able to at least speak up. You might not be able to have that resolved, but it is a possibility and you do want to have that chemistry. Otherwise your openness is going to be reduced for sure. So, hey. Marilyn, I appreciate everything that you've shared up to this point. I want to go just a little bit deeper into where do you see coaching? Now we're talking about the future. Mm. And, I mean, you're mostly working in the corporate. But I, I'm thinking more general terms. Where do you see coaching going going in, in the future for all of us? You know, so I have quite a diverse listening group from individuals just on their own, people that own small businesses, some corporate individuals. So where do you see coaching going, you owning a coaching school? Where do you see it going into the future? Have, have we met our maturity or there, what's new? Okay. Uh, uh, met our maturity, not at all. Uh, great coaches assist people to think well. And right now on uh, our small blue dot of a planet, thinking well is a critical uh, result that we want to create, not only corporately, but nationally. Um, I see many, more, we're actually working with some uh, uh, leaders in uh, several countries where it makes quite a big difference to um, um, see how effectively that coach can affect uh, the way that leader begins to, first of all, perceive people around them, um, relax around stressors, think well, 
again, and um, work with the people that they're serving. So I, I think that where we're going is to get much more effective on a national level, um, assist to help some of the huge difficulties that are going to show up shortly, I think, from climate change. Uh, they're already showing up. Uh, the world's going through some serious times already from uh, big storms, etc. cetera. Um, lessening the potential of war. I mean, that's an area where uh, when once leaders start to work with coaches, uh, there's critical conversations that a, a coach can have help them have that um, bring out the statesman rather than the um, monger, so to speak. Mm. Now, right now, also, the nature of work is changing. So uh, we're having far more uh, AI industries rising with robots, etc. People are um, needing to shift the nature of their work and their thinking. Coaches are assisting a lot with uh, corporate changes around this. So I see coaching becoming more and more needed rather than um, less as these difficulties face us. They're as, all yeah, as, the, as the complexity uh, bears upon us. And so what you're saying, Marilyn, is getting a coach isn't a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength. Absolutely. Because if it's we actually a, scroll back, that would say, well, I don't need a coach because that, I'm really revealing my incompetence. So, and I mentioned that earlier. So rather than see that, we see coach just as something that's equipping me to go to the next level. Uh, you're saying it beautifully. Well, I'm glad that came out that way then. So with, <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, uh, first of all, before we get into, we just have a couple of minutes left, but before we get into wrapping up the show, Marilyn, uh, how can people get a hold of you? What's the your website for your business? Oh, thank you, Ken. Uh, go to www.erickson, E-R-I-C-K-S-O-N, dot E-D-U. E-D-U is for education. We're an education organization. And we're offering many different kinds of coach training. Um there's uh, actually free two-hour programs where you can try it out, see how it works. Uh, you can uh, have an experience talking to some of our coaches on the phone and, and discovering uh, their effectiveness. So uh, please take a look at Ericsson. Uh, we've been the, we're probably the oldest coaching company in the world. Uh, we're about to celebrate our 40th anniversary this uh, January. And we're also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most widespread. Uh, we keep growing. Uh, I suspect we're the largest coaching company in the world. And we're training about 2,000 coaches a year in different countries. So um, North America has a lot of Ericsson coaches. And I suggest you look for an Ericsson coach because you'll meet people who have uh, expertise in listening to how you are putting together your thoughts, your thought systems, and your inspiration. Coaching is about becoming inspired and using your inspiration to build your future. Mm. Well, you actually just led a statement there as far as wrapping up about why would we consider coaching you know, sort of as a final comment. So first of all, again, congratulations on all the success and the impact you're having around the world and you're at this tipping point. And then I think when we were chatting not that long ago, uh, CRG, this is our 40th year. So we really sort of uh, were launched and born at the same time. So, you know, the longevity says and states something about Ericsson. So thank you for that. And you also are in Vancouver, which is close to where I live. So that's, there's a bonus there. That's just the complete bias statement being made there. So I appreciate that. So Marilyn, with that being said, what is the last bit of wisdom that you would like to share with the listeners to encourage them going forward based on everything that we've said? What would be maybe another tidbit or piece of wisdom to encourage people out there that are 
maybe just struggling in life and they want to go to the next level. Hmm. Uh, you're putting me in a place where I can't help say a few things that are important to me. The first one is uh, we move past our own problems quickly when we take on a game worth playing, take on big problems, take on something bigger than our life, and link to the development of others in that process. Uh, often people aim for comfort and happiness and it doesn't work. But if you explore your unique contribution, uh, then all sorts of things start to happen. You have a unique contribution. We all do. And if you commit yourself to results, then you have access to all sorts of areas of your mind and heart and abilities that start to link together and you develop those abilities. You're linking to the future, you're linking to the development of others, and uh, it becomes much easier to find your values, commit to them, and choose to live by them. Mm. Wow, I think for people that are listening, Marilyn, they're gonna have to rewind, which you really you're just gonna have to go back and re-listen to this. Rewind is our stage when we had cassettes, but to go back and just listen to that statement of wisdom uh, several times and I agree with you, Marilyn, is that, you know, we're all here for a purpose and that we want to be connected and plug into that. And that's where our highest, not only contribution, but meaning and fulfillment is. So, Marilyn, Dr. Marilyn Atkinson, thank you very much for being on our show today. Well, thank you very much, Ken. You're and welcome. You're welcome. I appreciate your questions. Um, they were delightful. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Well, you're, you're welcome. And uh, great guests uh, make host look easy or good or whatever <laughs> word we want to use. We'll just make up a verb. So listeners, go to erickson.edu. We'll put it in the show notes. Find out more about Marilyn, our company, her coaches all around the world. And since this podcast goes all around the world, it could, you could have a coach near you. If not, everybody does it online or via Skype these days. So that's that area. My encouragement is, is when we think about coaches and that's been the theme today that Marilyn brought to us is that it's not a negative to get a coach is actually showing your strength it's showing your willingness to develop and that all of us have blind spots Marilyn and myself included we're not eh, <laughs> exempt from this situation we need to be able to have coaches and I know that I've had coaches over my lifetime and that when I've had them that is when I've had the best growth because none of us really should or could do it on our own thank you for listening to secrets of success if you like what we're doing please pass it on share it let other people know about it leave a positive comment on whatever platform you're listening on i'm your host dr ken keith thanks for exploring the secrets of success with us if you want to keep the momentum going log on to crgleader.com scroll to the bottom and sign up for our inspirational emails you can also take your success to the next level by following us on Facebook and Twitter and connecting with Ken on LinkedIn. We hope you have a great week and look forward to you joining us next time for the Secrets of Success podcast with Dr. Ken Keyes.